I'm really excited about this fast and this year and the Jesus Calling devotionals and what God is doing because, you know, it's amazing. First Wednesday, God showed up in a spectacular way and it started on Tuesday night with prayer and they started singing that song, Holy. And when they started singing that, the presence of God invaded the place really heavy and we knew that was the theme then of the, of the, of the fast and Every day, I want you to download that song. Every one of y'all in here just about has a smartphone. You can get on it. You've got a computer. You can get on YouTube, type in holy, get this song, play it every day. Bask in the presence of God. Let him change you. And the day afterwards, I was, Kimpy and I were in, in the car going out of town to Lydia's game, and we were listening to a guy about how he changed his life, dieting of all things. And then he made this comment, he said this one phrase, he said, I was too fat to fly. And when he said that, the Spirit of God hit me. And God said, that's how my children are. They're too fat to fly. I'm not talking about physically, I'm talking about spiritually. We've got too much of weight of the world on our shoulders. We've got the, the, the influences of the world coming in us. We're carrying around bitterness, anger. We're carrying around unforgiveness. We're carrying around unbelief. And God said, it's time for you to shake it off, to get defatted, to get it off of you during this time. Because I want to take you on a journey, and I want you to be able to fly above the circumstances, but fly above all the things in life, and to soar with Him. And how many of y'all want to be ready to do that? Well, one of the ways we're doing it is what's going on now, but we've got to understand we serve a holy God. Yes, He's my friend. Yes, He cares about the things of this world, but He is holy, and we have to recognize that. And be able to understand that. I love it. A.W. Tozier said this. I believe we ought to have again the old biblical concept of what of which makes God awful. And makes men lie face down and cry. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Now he's not talking about awful as God is an awful being. He's talking about awful as in we have got to understand his power, his authority, his justice, his mercy. We've got to be in awe of him. We're talking about God. He is distinct. He is unique. He is not like any other God. He is God and he is holy. And we have to recognize that. Look at Psalms first, uh, chapter 97. The Lord is king. Let the earth rejoice. Let the farthest coastlands be glad. Dark clouds surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. If you want to know if he's fair, if you want to know if he's just, what does Psalms 97 said? Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. You might not understand something. You might not believe, you might not have a clue what's going on, but let me tell you something. He is fair. He is just and righteousness and justice are the foundation of where he sits. He is powerful. He is God. I love that. Fire spreads ahead of him and burns up all his foes. His lightning flashes out across the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness. Every nation sees his glory. Do you want to know why America so interests everybody else? Because the glory of the Lord is above this place. And as long as we keep him there, he will forever shine on America. But let me tell you something. How we treat Israel matters to God. And God said, those who bless Israel, I will bless them. Those who curse Israel, I will curse them. I know they're a little tiny place all to themselves. But let me tell you something. The hand of God is there. That's God's land. And whatever we do, we're going to be judged accordingly. But God said, listen, the mountains wax before him. Even the creation itself cannot stand in the presence of Almighty God. I love that. Let all the earth rejoice. Those who worship idols are disgraced. All who brag about their worthless gods for every God must bow to him. Jerusalem has heard and rejoiced, and all the towns of Judah are glad because of your justice, O Lord. For you, O Lord, are supreme over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. We must renew our sense of awe 
of him. We must create a feeling of reverence when we come into the presence of Almighty God. You know, I tease, I tease my mother all the time because I'm going to tell you what, she will joke with the, everybody. She will be the best one. She can get to do all that stuff. But when it comes to her prayer time, when it comes to being in the presence of Almighty God, you better not crack a joke around it. You better not tease about it because she is serious. She is in the presence of Almighty God. Don't you mess with that time. Don't you mess with that. We all need to be that way. When I'm up here worshiping God, don't come up and tell me something silly and frivolous. I'm in the presence of Almighty God. I am worshiping Him with every fiber of my being. I don't care what's happening over there. I don't care what's happening over there. I'm in the presence of God. We've got to get that awe and that sense of what we're doing and that we're in worship with Him. We need to have a fresh vision of God as the Holy One. Psalms 99 says it this way, The Lord is King, let the nations tremble. He sits on his throne between the cherubim. Let the whole earth quake. The Lord sits in majesty in Jerusalem, exalted above all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Your name is holy, mighty king, lover of justice. You have established fairness. You have acted with justice and righteousness throughout Israel. Exalt the Lord our God. Bow low before his feet, for he is holy. Holy. Why should the nations tremble? Because he is holy. He is set apart. He is high above all the others. He is sovereign God. We need to only realize that God is holy. And his awe is bound to come back. We've got to have it. When we understand how holy he is, we'll begin to reverence him like we ought to. We'll be able to be in awe of being in the presence of him. We'll ought to be excited. You know, I I think about coming here. I get to be in the presence of God. How awesome is that? He is holy. The one who rules is a holy rule. The power that governs is a holy power. And when sin comes in time contact with that holy one who rules and that holy one with holy power, when sin comes in contact with that, there's a collision and sin cannot stand in the presence of God. We are forever changed. I love that song that says, He called my name, I'll never be the same. When you come in contact with the very presence of God, you will never be the same. You know, I love that about our kids when they come to church and they come down here and worship. They're having an encounter with God himself. And when they do that, I don't have to worry about where they're going in the future because they'll never be able to get away from what it felt like to be in the presence of God. They'll have to come home. God is mighty. All who sin bring themselves into that. The destinies of the world are not in the, at the mercy of our great naval force, our military base. Yes, I believe in all that. Yes, I believe we ought to have a strong army. I believe we ought to have a strong navy. But let me tell you, our power is not in how strong our navy is. Our power is not in how strong our army is. Our power is in the one who sits on the throne. And we've got to remember that as long as we do what he wants and we pray and we seek his face, God will forever have our back. And we've got to stand on that. The Lord reigns and he rules and he governs the fears of this world. Knowing that he, he, God, the Holy One, sits on the throne. And the power of who he is. And the power that he holds. And the power of his grace. And the power of his mercy. And the power only then will you not have fear and despair. You know, it make Christians amaze me. They t- sometimes I don't, I don't even say, I'm thinking, are you, are you in the same realm I am? Are you still worshiping the same God I am? Because we just had an election. And I'm not talking about who won. It doesn't matter which one of them won because it would have been this way. Half of y'all would have been this way if the other one won and half of you would have been this way if no matter what. It doesn't matter which one won. Half of you are gloating and thinking God himself got in the throne and the other half are mad and angry because of who got in there. Did y'all forget who sits on the throne? Did you forget the one who rules? Either way, we shouldn't be because God can't move when we're gloating and he can't move when we're in despair. When he sits on the throne, when we know who the Holy One is, there is no despair. There is no fear because he is God. And it's time we start acting like his children and that we depend on him and nobody else because he's the one that sits on the throne. The problem is we've got away from all of that. And when we've done that, the church has not been as triumphant as it should have been. Folks, we can't be 
in disarray. We can't be in fear and doubt. We can't be in, be in disunity. The church of God must be in unity. We must know who's sitting on the throne. And then and only then will we be the triumphant church we are to be. The world is looking for a place that has the answers. They're not looking for another place to entertain them. They're not looking for another place to just have good music. They're not looking for another place to somebody who's just a great communicator. They're looking for the power and the presence of a holy God. And we must set the atmosphere for that to be in this house. That's where our confidence comes from. I'm telling you what, when we have that triumphant mindset, mindset we don't get depressed we don't get into despair. We don't get into grief. We don't get into anger. We don't get into bitterness because we don't have time for that. I love that somebody said something to me one time and I looked at them and I said, I ain't got time for that. We don't have time for anything that's going to affect our walk with God. I don't have time for anything that's going to feed into my spirit, man, and make me think thoughts that God doesn't want me to think. I don't have time to hear gossip about somebody that's going to make me view them in a different way. I've got to stay focused on what he wants. I've got to be kingdom-minded, God-focused, God is holy, and stay about my business. Amen? We all need to be that way so the church can be triumphant. It's a time to realize his name is holy and he is holy. His glory and his honor and his power belong to him. An encounter with the holy God changes you. Isaiah 64 verse 1. It says, oh God, that you would burst forth from the heavens and come down. How the mountains would quake in your presence. As fire causes wood to burn and water to boil, your coming would make the nations tremble. Then your enemies would learn the reason of your fame. I love that. The waters would boil. When I think about that, what do they say? We are full of the living waters. When we get full of the Holy Ghost and He comes on the inside of us, out of our mouth will flow rivers of living water. Let the fire of God come down and the water inside of us start boiling on the inside so that when we speak, the power of God comes out and it's His words that are coming out of our mouth. You will never be the same. And the person in the, that you come in contact with will never be the same. The fire of God will come up on the inside of you. Oh, that he would be there. How many of y'all want those living waters to boil on the inside of you? To come forth and then his name will be known. I love that this was the source of the apostles. They had the fresh fire in them and every prayer meeting was an opportunity to get refreshed and filled again. Why do you think God said, do not forsake the assembling of yourself together with other believers? Because it's in the house you get refreshed. It's in the house that you get refilled. It's in the presence of God that that water starts to boil on the inside of you. It's being with other believers in that corporate prayer time, in that corporate unity, that the fire of God burns so on the inside of you that wherever you go, I want to be like those children they've written a book about. They started going into hospitals and praying for people. It emptied the hospital. When we go visit people, the power of God should be so on fire for us that when we walk by a room, they get healed. Amen? Well, it's time for us to have the fire of God on the inside of us. I want us to have that experience. I love it. C.S. Lewis said this, How little people know who think holiness is dull. When one meets the real thing, it is irresistible. I want the presence of God to be so in this place that when they walk in the door, they're forever changed. That being more and more like him, to flow with him, to be with him, to be in his presence becomes irresistible and they can't take it anymore. I want the presence of God to be in here. You know, there's an experiment that Isaac Newton did one time where he stared at the image of the sun reflected in a mirror. The brightness burned into his retina and he suffered temporary blindness. He hid for three days behind closed doors in a totally dark room. But that bright, that bright spot would not fade from his vision. I want us to have an encounter with the glory of God like that. That, that. that burns on the inside of us forever. And that image and the feeling and being in the presence. And the glory of God fallen never leaves us. We're forever marked to be in his presence. I want to find it irresistible. Exodus 15 verse 11. He says, Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Glorious in holiness, awesome in splendor, performing great wonders. You raised your right hand and swallowed our enemies. With your unfailing love, you lead the people you have redeemed. In your might, you guide them to your sacred 
home. We're looking for an encounter with a holy God. I love the fact that I know that when I'm in his presence and I'm praying and I know that God's got me, that no matter who's coming against me, the hand of God goes before me and it takes care of all my enemies. I don't have to worry about a thing. I don't have to carry the weight of it. My God goes before me. And you know what? I love it. He goes before me. He's got me on the side and he's got me behind. God's got me covered every way I turn. And I don't have to worry about what people say, what people think, what the enemy's trying to do at me. God is God and he's on the throne and he takes care of us. We've got to have a God like that. I want to talk about Isaiah when he had an encounter with God. But I want to give you a little back background first. Isaiah was one of the greatest prophets in all of Israel. He was a statesman. He gave words to the common man and he gave words to the kings. He prophesied during the reign of four kings over a period of 60 years, which were filled with crisis and moral decay. The king of Judah at the time was Uzziah. He reigned for 52 years. The Bible tells us that at the beginning he was a great king, but he got full of pride. And when he got full of pride, he got leprosy and he ended up dying. So this is at the time that the king had died. The transfer of power is about to occur. They don't know who the next king's going to be. Isaiah does what every Christian should do. He runs to the temple. And in the temple, he's seeking the face of God. He don't know if God's going to give him a word for somebody else or if God's going to tell him what's going to happen next. But he's seeking the face of God. And in that, when he goes to the temple, he has an encounter with God. God opens his eyes and he sees into the heavens. Look at Isaiah chapter 6. Verse 1 says, It was the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, it's all over. I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I've lived among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar, with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom shall I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? I said, Here I am. Send me. In that brief time that God opened up the heavens and Isaiah saw the Lord, he saw Lord, the Lord's majesty, he saw the Lord's mercy, and he saw the Lord's mission. Isaiah was saying in the year that King Uzziah died, they lost a king, but he forgot who was the king. He forgot that God is still sitting on the throne. And I love the picture that God gave him. He's sitting on the throne and his train filled the temple. It means it covered every chair, every pew, every altar. It covered up in the balcony. It covered every area. And that train represents the victories that God has over your life. Every time you've got a victory, every time you walk in victory, every time the enemy's defeated, there's another section of train added onto that. And the glory of God said it was so full, it filled every part of the temple. And I believe God now is overflowing out of that temple because the God is still having victory in our life. Amen? Amen. And God, he saw that. And then he said, there's no reason to panic when God is on the throne. You know, it may look to... Isaiah, that everything was falling apart, but I love it. Here's Isaiah, a prophet, a prophet for a long time, a well-known prophet, a good prophet, a good man of God. But yet in the presence of God, he saw how wretched he is. See, it doesn't matter how good you sing and how good you preach or how much you serve God or how you compare yourself to another person and you're living a better life than they are. None of that matters. When you become encounter with a holy God, you see all the things inside of you that shouldn't be. And he said, here I am, a man with unclean lips. 
Some of us might be carrying a nasty attitude or some of us might carry a bitterness towards somebody else or some of us might be carrying anger or some of us might be carrying something inside of us. But whatever it is, no matter who you are, when you're in God's presence, all the parts of your personality, all the parts of your life, all the things that you did, they become nasty to you in the presence of God. Because without Him, we are nothing. With Him, we are everything. I've served God every day of my life, but yet still in His presence, there's attitudes that I have to get rid of. There's still in His presence, there's things that I might have said that I have to repent for. Whatever it is, when you're in His presence, He cleans you up. You can't stay in His presence with that inside of you. I love that each time Israel describes the ser- uh, Isaiah describes the seraphim. There are a certain group of angels whose personal calling was to attend to God's holiness. They are the closest angels to God. They focus on praising and worshiping Him for who He is and what He does. They spend most of their time directly in God's presence. That's why they've got six wings. Two of them have to cover their face because even they can't stand in the presence of a holy God. Even they, His glory is so bright, they have to shield their faces from His glory. They have to cover their feet because they're in holy territory. Remember when God told Moses, remove your shoes where you're standing on holy ground. You're in the presence of Almighty God. They're the closest ones to him. I love this. They focus on praising and worshiping him. They celebrate God's holiness and the joy of expressing God's pure love by leading worship in heaven. They constantly sing and speak about their love for him. They fly around continuously saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with His glory. The word seraphim literally means to burn. They burn with passion for God. They are fiery guardians of the holiness of who He is. Why do they say holy, holy, holy three times? A lot of Bible scholars want to say it's because anytime you want to emphasize something, you repeat it more than once. But I believe it means a lot more than that. They're singing, holy is God the Father. Holy is God the Son. Holy is God the Holy Spirit. He's three distinct beings, but yet he's one. And all parts of him are holy, for he is holy. And we have to acknowledge all of them, because all of them have a place. And yet he is God. What does holy mean? The root of the word means to cut or to separate. It's the very Godness of God means that he is separate from all that is not God. There is an infinite difference between the creator and the creation. There is not anyone or anything like them. He is distinct and he is unique. When somebody says what you are like, there's six billion other people you could point to and say, I'm just like them. When you ask God what he is like, there is no other compared to him. There is nothing and no one that can compare to his majesty. Nothing and no one that can compare to his uniqueness. Nothing and no one that can compare to his holiness. He is God, separate and holy. He is, I love this, he is omnipresent. The whole earth is full of his glory. That means he is there, high and lifted up, and he is here right beside me. He is sitting on the right hand of the Father, but yet he's my best friend. He's the Holy Spirit hovering over the face of the earth, but yet he's inside of me at the same time. He is transcendent, which means everywhere. He's separate from us, and yet he's right here with us. He is to be feared, but yet he is our friend. Let's look at what Isaiah experienced in verse 4. It says that, Their voices shook the temple to its foundation, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Now, I can only imagine what it was like to actually see the Lord high and lifted up. But then all of a sudden, to hear that choir of angels singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of armies. Can you imagine what that was like to hear it? And they said it was so loud that the building began to shake. Can you imagine us being in the presence of God and His glory filling this place so much that the very foundations of this building shake with the glory of God? You know, I don't know if y'all remember when we first moved here and we were worshiping one day and the fire truck showed up outside and it said they saw fire coming out of the top of this building. I'm ready for a visitation from God like that again. That the fire, the presence, the glory of God so invades this place. Hebrews 12 says God is a consuming fire and you can't play around with the presence of God. 
Listen, I believe in God's mercy. I believe in God's grace. I believe that he is a God full of compassion and he's full of grace. But let me tell you something. I want to remind you that Ananias and Sapphira were under grace in the New Testament. But when they came against God... When they touched something that God called anointed. When they wanted to be there and they withheld their money. They were saying, let's hold on to this. God wasn't concerned about how much they kept back. What he was concerned was with the motive of holding it back. When they said, let's hold this back in case this thing doesn't work. They came against God, not a person. And when they did that, they fell under the presence of God dead. Because I'm telling you, the power and the presence of God, you can't stand before him. Without a pure heart and a clean heart. I love that fact that God is awesome. But he's also full of mercy and he's full of grace. You see, Isaiah, even though he was a prophet, saw how wretched he was. He could have been the best of men. But in our own eyes and in God's eyes, it's two different things. We can't go by what other people say about us. Because it doesn't matter how much they praise you. It doesn't matter how great they think you are. All that matters is what God thinks. And when I stand before him, I want to stand before him with a pure heart, with a pure mouth to say, God, I only want to speak what you want me to speak and say what you want me to speak. God, I want to be able to stand in the presence of a holy God and come out with fire. Amen. Come out with an increased anointing to soar above my circumstances and be able to have the fire and the power of God to change somebody else's life. Isaiah said that because I'm. John Calvin said this, Men are never duly touched and impressed with a conviction of their insignificance until they have confronted themselves with the majesty of God. No matter how great you are, in His presence you're nothing. You've got to have Him. As, I, as long as Isaiah could compare himself with other people, he was able to sustain a lofty opinion of himself. But when he compared himself to God, he saw how wretched he was. The most important instrument of a prophet was his mouth. And see, in his own polluted depravity, he cries out, I am a man of unclean lips. But how many of you want to thank God for his mercy? Thank God for his grace. Because an angel comes and picks up one of those coals and puts it on his lips and said, you are now a man of clean lips. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us and washes us clean and makes us whole all over again. That we're able to stand in the presence of God. I love the fact that when God sees me, he doesn't see all my mistakes. He sees me covered in the blood of the lamb to be able to stand in his presence. I love that. We don't have to understand all the holiness of God. We have to understand who we are in him. Isaiah would never be the same again, and neither will we when we acknowledge his holiness. Too many of us are playing church games. We're compromising. We're disobeying whenever we feel like it, right in the face of a holy God. It's time for us to clean up our act. It's time for us to be ready for him. I was talking to somebody and they were continuing in their sin and they said but i'm enjoying it for right now my flesh is enjoying it and they said i still love god but right now i just want to let my flesh have a little bit of pleasure and i'll come back and i said you don't love god and they said yes i do i love him and i said no you don't because you can't continue doing what you're doing and saying lord i love you but i'm going to turn my back on you so i can satisfy my flesh for a little while and i'll come back to you when i'm ready that's not love Love for him means I don't care what my flesh wants. I want you, God, in all of your holiness and purity. But I'll tell you, fast for a little while. You'll see how much your flesh controls. Kippy and I were talking yesterday. We, we've decided not to do the Daniel fast because I got too focused on food when I did the Daniel fast. And I don't want to be thinking about food during the day. I want to be thinking about him. I want to be in his word. So we've decided we'll fast everything but one meal. And it's amazing how much my flesh screams until 6 o'clock. And then it's like magic at 6 o'clock. I'm not hungry anymore. But my flesh doesn't rule me. Believe me, it wants to, and you have to talk to it. You have to tell it to shut up and die. Kippy's brother was telling us that one day he, he works at a nursing home. He's an activity director, and he was fasting, and he was walking down the hallway, and he's going, shut up, shut up. You don't rule me. You can't control me. You can't tell me what to do. And they said, Jim, are you okay? He said, yeah, I'm just talking to my flesh. It can't rule me. You may sound silly, but you've got to sometimes talk to it and tell it to shut up. Amen? But God wants us to be ready. No one can stand in the presence of God without becoming profoundly and devastatingly aware of of our own sinfulness. Too many of us want to 
do our own thing, but we've got to be in the presence of God. Let me tell you, Wednesday night, the presence of God fell in this place when we were singing that song. And everybody that was here will never be the same again after that. God has shown up plenty of times in this house. But let me tell you, he wants to take us on a whole nother level. And when I want to be in the right place at the right time with the right heart and the right attitude, that I can soar when he's ready to take us there. Amen? We've got to be there. And if you've been fasting and taking the Jesus um, calling challenge and playing the song holy, I'm promising you, you will encounter the presence of God. You will encounter that holiness of God. And you will never be the same. Which means this church will never be the same. God wants to do something in this place. Amen? We want your faith ignited. We want you to do it. I love it. Isaiah saw the Lord's majesty. He was overcome with his own sinfulness and he saw the mercy of God. And then in verse 8, it says he saw the mission of God. Then I heard the Lord asking, whom shall I send as a messenger to these people? Who will go for us? I said, here I am, send me. Like Isaiah, we cannot be fit for service until we clean up our act. We can't be fit for service because you can't be fit. You're not a vessel for the honor and the power and the glory that God has to reside on the inside of you till you get rid of the fat that's on you and get rid of the fluff that's on you and get rid of the stuff. It's time for us to let it all go. So look at your neighbor and say, let it go. If you want to be those people that stand and say, Lord, here I am, send me. Stand to your feet. We're going to sing that song again, holy.